The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello and welcome to Health for a Lifetime. I'm your host Don McIntosh and today we're going to be talking about cancer. It is a word that strikes fear in the hearts of many. We're talking with us today about this disease and al also some treatment options is Dr. Neil Nedley. Dr. Nedley, we're glad you're with us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Don. Now you, you practice internal medicines, deals with the organ systems of the body, but you also are an educator, uh, author of, of several books, and uh, you get out and you see a lot of things and you're with a lot of people. But uh, probably one of the most troubling things you have to talk about is cancer. It is. It's diagnosed uh, by us uh, on a weekly basis, sometimes more than once a week. But uh, often I have to bring the patient into the office and tell them that the biopsy results are back and it's what we feared. Uh, it's cancer. Now when you, you know, give that diagnosis, I'm sure that they don't listen to you much right then because they're so shocked and... Uh, Often they don't hear a lot else. Right. So, but when they come back, do you have any uh, hope for them? Is there any hope for people that have a diagnosis of cancer? Well, uh, there can be actually. It depends on uh, how confined the cancer is, how far it is spread and uh, it depends upon uh, the organ system and the type of tissue. Uh, there's a lot of variables uh, in cancer. Uh, it's the number one cause of death in people under the age of 85 in the United States. And so, uh, and it kills children even. Uh, people of all ages can get cancer. It's not just a disease of the elderly. But uh, it really, uh, it, because of what we're learning in regards to cancer treatment, uh, their, the cancer deaths are now starting to plateau mm -hmm. and in fact some of the studies are actually starting to come down a little bit and I think as we learn more about the uh, treatment as well as particularly the prevention of cancer uh, we ought to see uh, greater strides in that regard. Good, so there's good news. Now let's say uh, um, you know I th probably the best thing is to avoid cancer altogether through prevention and through healthy lifestyle that's right. Harvard University has stated that 80% of all cancers are actually preventable. And this is a perfect uh, case where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure mm. because the cures for cancer sometimes uh, are damaging. Uh, we're trying to fight a war. And when we're fighting a war in the body, sometimes good cells die off. Uh, and uh, the cancer treatments can be expensive. They can be um, uh, decrease your quality of life and uh, even if you do get a cure. And so an ounce of prevention certainly is worth a pound of cure and that prevention has to do with what we're eating, uh, what we're putting into our body, what we're doing with our body, whether we're exercising or not, and even how much sunlight we're getting. So 80% could be completely avoided. I mean, uh, the other day we were talking about heart disease, you and I, and you said that 90% of that could be prevented. 80% of cancer could be prevented. Um, and uh, catch-up work is not easy when it comes to getting rid of cancer. What kind of things? You'd mentioned several things. Diet, exercise, sunlight, but let's talk about diet. What kind of things should we be avoiding if we want to prevent cancer? We really need to avoid carcinogens. Carcinogens are substances in the environment that can get into our cell, change our cells into cancerous cells. Mm. And uh, some of the foods that are associated with cancer uh, are meat or animal products. Meat has been linked to cancer of the pancreas, cancer of the breast, of the prostate, of the colon, and even lymphoma, which continues to rise uh, in our society. And so the less meat, uh, the less cancer. The less frequently is consumed, the less cancer. 
And uh, of course, we want to avoid tobacco. Smoking. Alcohol actually is a carcinogen. A lot of people are not aware of that. Just one drink every 15 days can increase a woman's risk of breast cancer by 60 percent. 60 percent, wow. Alcohol also increases the risk of colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, caffeine, which is a co-carcinogen. Uh, if that's around and other carcinogens around, caffeine allows it to get into the cell to change that cell more readily. Uh, and then there are things that we want to not avoid but uh, get more of, and that's fruits and vegetables. Uh, fruits and vegetables have antioxidants and are very uh, potent in helping to protect us from cancer. Uh, legumes, uh, soy, also protective, garlic, protective. Okay. So basically, the very, uh, very simply, things that were created to be eaten, fruit, uh, eaten rather, fruits, nuts, grains, and then later vegetables. That's Those right. are very protective and everything else, watch out. <laughs> well, uh, pretty much, that's right. <laughs> pretty simple. Okay, well, uh, what about cholesterol? Well, uh, interestingly, cholesterol has been linked to um, certain cancers, and the question is, is it the cholesterol causing the cancer or the foods that increase your cholesterol levels also increase the risk of cancer? Uh, for instance, ovarian cancer has been linked to high cholesterol levels. Okay. And in, in cancer treatment, cholesterol also can be important when we get to the treatment section. Okay, wonderful. Um, now, go back to some of the plants. What are some of the plants that can be uh, protective? Well, uh, in regards to cancer treatment, and now this is not just protecting against cancer, okay. but if we actually have cancer, okay. there are some of the uh, plant foods that have come out uh, as potentially uh, helping to treat cancer. And this is kind of new information. You know, for years, we have known that foods can help prevent cancer. But we have pretty much uh, taught people that once they get cancer, the foods aren't important anymore. Uh, the, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak, and, uh, and so we need to go after that horse uh, with uh, all sorts of things, and lifestyle isn't as important. We're now learning that that's not true. The lifestyle that you change to after you get cancer is critically important as to how long you might survive that cancer. So you've got your arsenal of foods that, uh, that can actually treat cancer. What, what would you say is, is one of those foods? Well, one of those uh, for prostate cancer, for instance, is pomegranate juice. I think we have a graphic uh, in regards to pomegranate juice. This study was done at UCLA, and mm -hmm. you can see it was uh, published uh, in May of 2005, actually announced at that time at the American Urological Association meeting. And there you can see a picture on the screen of uh, the actual pomegranates. This uh, study was done on uh, 48 uh, men. And uh, these 48 men had surgery or radiation for prostate cancer. So they had had some advanced prostate cancer. And just eight ounces of pomegranate juice a day slowed the doubling time in their prostate cancer by almost two years. Mm. It also significantly decreased the rise in the PSA, or the prostate-specific antigen. And this is the way, if you've had prostate cancer, you have a relative that has prostate cancer, if they're getting followed. Those uh, are watching them. That's right, that's a blood test uh, that they can do. Uh, pomegranate juice contains a number of antioxidants thought to have anti-cancer effects. Uh, it contains estrogen-like plant substances called phytoestrogens that could be useful in combating prostate cancer as well. And so uh, it's kind of amazing that something as simple as pomegranate juice uh, can actually be a form of treatment uh, for prostate cancer. And this is something that's not going to harm you at all. There's no side effects in using uh, pomegranate juice. It's not going to make your hair fall out or anything like that. In mm. fact, it might even preserve hair. Uh, because of its estrogen-like uh, molecules in it. And so I would recommend any man who has a history of prostate cancer to take advantage of this and drink a cup of pomegranate juice a day. And you can get that. I've seen it in the store. It's right there in these little bottles. And it's quite expensive, it looks like to me, when I was in the store the last time. But it's a lot less uh, costly than uh, the other cancer treatments, I'm sure. Yeah, and it's starting to come down uh, in price because it's becoming more uh, widely available. So pomegranate juice. Pomegranate juice, yes. Interesting, yeah. Now, uh, there's also uh, something in regards to bladder cancer that can be helpful. Now, when people have uh, bladder cancer, 
Mm -hmm. uh, often one of the treatments uh, that's used is BCG. Uh, it's actually uh, put into the bladder or injected into the system. BCG is one of those things that we used to use as a vaccine for tuberculosis. Okay. But it can be deadly. There are side effects of it. Uh, and uh, into the bladder itself, there have been deaths reported. And so we would really like a better treatment uh, for a bladder cancer. And one of the treatments uh, that emerged uh, in a study recently was actually mistletoe. Mistletoe. Mistletoe is, of course, you know, it, uh, it has its... Uh, uh, it's where, where you kiss your girlfriend under the tree or something, right? <laughs> well, if you want to get kissed, you go oh, under the I mistletoe. See. That's the yeah. idea. Okay. But after surgery for superficial uh, bladder cancer, uh, what they did was actually inject mistletoe uh, into the bladder. There are some substances in mistletoe that were thought to potentially uh, be tre a treatment for bladder cancer. And in these 30 uh, patients uh, that were actually done in, in Germany, this was a study in Europe, uh, their recurrence rate was actually the same or a little bit better than using BCG, and there was no side effects of the mistletoe injection. Mistletoe injection. I mean, I never would have thought. Yes. Now, who came up with that? Were they sitting around one day and say, I wonder if mistletoe works? And then maybe they did an analysis of the chemicals. Well, in yeah, that's right. There's an analysis that takes place of the chemicals first in the foods, and then we look in the laboratory dish to see if it can actually... Uh, uh, destroy. Actually, we're looking for destructive okay. properties uh, in cancer cells. And so, and then after that, you do the clinical study to actually find out uh, if that'll work. Interesting. So, mistletoe. mistletoe. What else do you have up your sleeve here? We've talked about mistletoes and uh, pomegranate juice. What, what else could be a treatment? Well, another treatment is know what your cholesterol level is. A okay. lot of people, when they get cancer, they say, who cares about my cholesterol? I need to get cancer cured. I don't really care about heart disease. But studies show that if you have a high cholesterol level, particularly if you have prostate cancer, getting that cholesterol level down can actually reduce your risk of recurrence of the prostate cancer. Okay, so high blood cholesterol can make the prostate tumors... Yeah, uh, I think we have a, a graphic? graphic on okay. that. Uh, and uh, this graphic is, is quite interesting. Uh, this was a uh, study done by uh, Dr. Michael Friedman, the Journal of Clinical Investigation in March of 2005, showing that high blood cholesterol can make prostate tumors actually grow faster. Mm. And uh, the test did not suggest that high cholesterol actually caused cancer, but did show that higher levels of the blood fats fueled the prostate cancer growth. Hmm. So when cholesterol is lowered, the prostate cancer growth actually stopped uh, significantly. And so, I, again, a, a recent study showing that the same foods that will help bring the cholesterol down uh, might actually stop the progression of prostate cancer. So cholesterol, you need to watch it irregardless of uh, if it's before or after you get the diagnosis. You know, um, when we come back, we're going to take a break here in a minute with Dr. Nelly. What I want to be talking with you about is some of the typical treatments. I want to see what you say about those as well. What about surgery? What about radiation? What about uh, the things we normally hear about? We're talking with Dr. Neil Nedley. We're talking about cancer. We're talking about its treatment. Join us when we come back. Are you confused about the endless stream of new and often contradictory health information? With companies trying to sell new drugs and special interest groups paying for studies that spin the facts, where can you find a common sense approach to health? One way is to ask for your free copy of Dr. Arnott's 24 Realistic Ways to Improve Your Health. Dr. Timothy Arnott and the Lifestyle Center of America produced this helpful booklet of 24 short, practical health tips based on scientific research and the Bible that will help you live longer, happier, and healthier. For example, did you know that women who drink more water lower the risk of a heart attack? Or that seven to eight hours of sleep a night can minimize your risk of ever developing diabetes? Find out how to lower your blood pressure and much more. If you're looking for help, not hype, then this booklet's for you. Just log on to 3abn.org and click on free offers or call us during regular business hours. You'll be glad you did. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Neil Nedley. 
And we're talking about cancer, something that can really get our attention and uh, trouble us greatly. And it is something to be worried about. And we're talking about treatments. And uh, before the break, we talked about several treatments that come from the uh, plant kingdom, if you will. Uh, we talked about cholesterol. We talked about pomegranate juice and uh, mistletoe you extract. Mistletoe <laughs> extract, which was a, a, a shocking one for me. I've never heard about that before. But you also mentioned in the break that sometimes uh, green tea is helpful. Yes, uh, green tea, not because of caffeine per se, because caffeine is a co-carcinogen. We'd like the green tea have the caffeine removed. Has a uh, substance in it that's abbreviated from a long word, EGCG. Uh, green tea has five times as much EGCG as uh, any other substance that's been found out there. And EGCG binds on to dihydrofolate reductase, okay. uh, and that's what actually chemotherapy drugs attempt to do uh, sometimes in, in preventing the cancer from multiplying and growing. Dihydrofolate reductase is one of those things that will accelerate uh, cancer growth. Mm. And so uh, green tea uh, has been shown to reduce the risk of uh, neural uh, cancers. and. Uh, uh, actually, it's also uh, been shown to um, uh, potentially help out uh, in other types of cancer as well. Now, one of the things we need to recognize, because EGCG can bind on to dihydrofolate reductase, it's not a good thing for people to consume when they're pregnant. Because it'll mess up the uh, Because it'll mess up the growth of the developing fetus, and it can actually be associated with spina bifida. Mm. Uh, and other neural tube disorders. But if you have cancer, it's one of those things that, um, particularly if it's a cancer that might be multiplying because of dihydrofolate reductase, it may be one of those things that you would want to partake. Uh, and green tea, you said, can you get uh, a form that doesn't have caffeine in it? Yes, you can get a decaffeinated form of green tea and still get the same benefit, in fact, even greater benefit uh, that way. Well, are there any other plants that we should know about? We have mistletoe, we have green tea, uh, we have pomegranates. What else? Well, there's a recent uh, study actually showing that uh, the feverfew plant, uh, at least one of the extracts from the feverfew plant, can be very helpful in blood cell malignancies, particularly uh, leukemia. And we have a graphic about this as well. Uh, parthenolide is a chemical derived from the feverfew plant, and it destroys acute myeloid leukemia cells, leaving normal bone marrow cells relatively unscathed. Mm. And that's different than chemo, which is going to also kill out the good cells, at least temporarily. Now, uh, the compound uh, actually seems to get at the root of the disease because it kills stem cells that give rise to not only acute myelocytic leukemia, but also chronic myelocytic leukemia. And both of those are major leukemia killers uh, in our country. This agent uh, was found to be much more specific to leukemia cells than the standard chemotherapy drug, which is ERIS-C. And just about everyone with these forms of leukemia will get ERIS-C, mm -hmm. but this compound from the feverfew plant uh, more potent and more selective against the actual bad cells. And so, again, we're uncovering uh, treatments that are in the natural world that may be superior to some of the uh, chemical treatments that we've derived. Now, now normally we wouldn't, you know, uh, cut some fresh fever few for lunch or for dinner. Um, so this is really, they're going out and just looking at plants. And how do they come up with the idea of, of which plants to study? Well, uh, it, again, it's bench research uh, that helps to uh, determine this. Mm -hmm. But part of the problem in all of this, I think we would have been much more far ahead of the game if it wasn't for some of the systems in our economics. Uh, because the feverfew plant is not something that you can patent. Okay. Uh, so you can't make money off it. And so if you can't patent it, then mm -hmm. you know, drug companies aren't going to be able to easily make money off of it. I and see. so they tend not to study these natural compounds. In fact, Dr. Agarwal uh, from uh, MD Anderson in Houston, one of the largest cancer treatment centers in the United States, recently has been studying turmeric. Turmeric is another uh, potent, uh, it has some potent chemicals in it that seem to go against certain types of cancer. In fact, uh, breast cancer, uh, melanoma, uh, even uh, multiple myeloma 
uh, and uh, prostate cancer, another, a, a number of different cancers turmeric seems to be able to go after. Mm. And uh, what he has been frustrated with is that no, he can't get any money from drug companies to support his studies. And so he said the only place that he can get money is from the National Institutes of Health uh, if they will, um, you know, give him some money for the study. Or interestingly, lately, I'm not sure how he's been doing it, but lately he has been getting money from the Defense Department uh, for his studies, particularly against breast cancer and turmeric. Hmm. And, well, why uh, would they give money for that? Well, I think part of the reason is is because they almost have an unlimited budget uh, at present, <laughs> and so uh, they have some extra money to go around, and I so see. they've been putting it uh, forward for something that's, uh, that will save lives instead of destroy them. Okay. Right. Well, interesting. So turmeric as well. Um, well, you know, a lot of these things seem to be better than, you know, or more specific, we're saying, although having the same effect in some senses as chemotherapy and radiation and whatnot, it's, uh, it, it seems to be even more specific. But does this mean we should, should maybe do away with radiation, chemotherapy, and those kind of things? Uh, well, not yet. Uh, you know, maybe eventually we'll have better types of chemotherapy, but it's not time yet to do away with them. In fact, um, you know, surgery it needs to be the first line treatment for cancer if it's amenable to that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have to remind people, some people with cancer mistakenly believe that if surgery is done, the cancer is going to spread. And so I've met people that have a confined tumor, for instance, to their breast. Uh, and they refuse to have surgery done. And unfortunately, that breast cancer is very likely going to spread. Uh, and, you know, barley grain and those type of things aren't going to be enough necessarily to prevent its spread. Okay. And so I have to remind them, which came first, sin or surgery? Okay. And uh, often they'll say, oh, well, of course, sin came first. But then I have to tell them you need to read the book of Genesis again. Uh, well, surgery right. came first, and both patients were satisfied with the results. Yeah, the man said, whoa, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so that was a very effective surgery. And, very effective surgery. And, uh, yeah, and that's, that's a good point. So surgery was a part of the perfect world before there was actually sin. And, you know, there's uh, evidence that God can guide the hand of the surgeon and can really help uh, the uh, surgeon to remove uh, that tumor. And so uh, as part of the Christian uh, a treatment, I think surgery needs to be considered as an option. Now, if it's already spread beyond the vital organ and it's other places, then surgery may not be of much benefit. And so we might want to look at uh, other treatments. Okay, so treatment of cancer. You say uh, on your next graphic you have also comprehensive lifestyle. Comprehensive lifestyle needs to be part of the treatment. We've talked about that. Uh, that's good diet and actually good exercise. Uh, one of the studies showed that uh, exercise reduces the risk of recurrence of cancer no matter uh, how advanced that cancer is. Uh, turmeric or curcumin, that's one of the things we recommend for since it seems to help a lot of cancers, that's part of the comprehensive lifestyle. But also surgery needs to be considered and notice that one up there, radiation. Uh, and then chemotherapy. Certain types of chemotherapy can virtually cure certain cancers. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, lymphoma, for instance, 70 80 percent chance of cure now, uh, where before it was universally fatal. Uh, and then we'll also talk about the last uh, treatment, which is also uh, vitally important, and that is prayer. Okay, so any of those we need to, you know, talk about a little bit more. What, you said surgery originated before the fall of man. <laughs> what about radiation? Do you have any uh, biblical metaphors concerning that? <laughs> well, uh, we know that uh, uh, when our protective layer went away uh, after Adam and Eve uh, sinned, that if we were exposed to God's radiation, it would actually destroy us. Uh, but focal radiation, we want to destroy certain cancers. And for instance, the proton beam radiation, uh, that Loma Linda and Harvard University utilize can destroy prostate cancer and it's been very effective. Mm -hmm. Other types of radiation can kill other types of cancers. Sometimes it's just a treatment to prevent the pain or to treat the pain uh, and it's not curative but uh, when it's focal uh, sometimes radiation is the best treatment. Interestingly Ellen White who wrote a lot about health uh, and uh, healthful living 
got cancer above her eye, and when she had cancer, she underwent X-ray treatment, 11 radiation therapy treatments. And when she died years later, the cancer was not there. Uh, it had been uh, cured or at least in remission as a result of the radiation. Okay, so taking nothing off the table, surgical means, radiation means, chemotherapy means. Chemotherapy, that tends to be a little more controversial because chemotherapy can kill the good cells. Uh, and how I look at it is, again, from a biblical example, uh, when the Amorites, when the Israelites wanted to go after the Amorites at first, the Lord said, no, their probationary period is not up. But when their probationary period was up, uh, he said it'll wipe them out entirely. And that's because if they, any of them were left behind, they could actually destroy the world, uh, the entire world spiritually. And when you have cancer diagnosed in your cells, I would say the probationary period of your cells is up. Those cells, at least. Those cells. Unless those cells are destroyed, that cancer will destroy you and will take your life. And so that means we need to go to war. And the Israelites would lose some good people, some good soldiers in those wars. That's what wars do sometimes. That's why it's so bad. But uh, if we kill out the cancer cells in the process, then the life can be spared and the individual can live for many years uh, later. And so it's good to ask the question in regards to how... Uh, a curative the chemotherapy is mm -hmm. and uh, you know sometimes the chance of cure is so low that it's hardly worth it it's just going to decrease the quality of life but if we have a high likelihood of cure let's take advantage of it what about the arsenal of prayer in the in the armory against cancer we we leave it to the last but uh, should we leave it to the last we shouldn't anyone who has cancer ought to utilize this spontaneous regression of cancer it's abbreviated SRC Every episode of spontaneous regression of cancer in the medical literature has been associated with prayer. Not just a prayer for the cancer cure, but a prayer putting the individual into the will of God. None of those people that were cured from cancer anticipated they were going to get cured. They had just put their life into the hands of God. And they were as shocked as anybody when the scans were done in follow-up and they had no cancer and uh, they're still living. And so uh, I would recommend for anyone who has cancer, this is the time to get your life uh, right with God uh, and uh, put your entire life into the will of God. Mm. And probably prayer is also preventive, wouldn't you say? So it's something that should be part of the lifestyle even before. That's right. Uh, part of the habitual uh, lifestyle and uh, asking the Lord to help us through every means. We've been talking with Dr. Neil Nedley. We've talked about cancer. It's a very uh, troubling diagnosis for many, but we have found that there is hope, that there is help. And uh, we've looked at some of the plant sources. We've looked at some of the traditional means of uh, stopping, eliminating, curing cancer. We hope that this program has been helpful to you and that you will take a moment, put your life again in God's hands through prayer.